Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland, and in this episode, I'll be reviewing this EX3203R monitor from BenQ. This is the first curved monitor that I've had in the SRG, and the focus of this review will be using it exclusively as a Sim Racing monitor, as, well, it has been reviewed more than a few times already for computer gaming duties. So let's get to it. So let's take a closer look at this BenQ EX3203R monitor. It's a very big piece of monitor here, as you can see. It's, uh, like I said, this, I've had a 32-inch monitor before in the Sim Racing Garage. I had three TN panels that were the 1920 by 1080s, and that was a long time ago. And then I went to the TN panels, also 1980, and went to the 27s. I kind of settled on 27. It's just one of my personal preferences. But this is a, a, a big piece here, this 32 inch. I forgot how big these were. I'm standing next to it. You can kind of see I'm five foot eight, about 150 pounds or so. So yeah, that gives you a general idea how big this is. Now, obviously the actual measurements on this thing are going to be a little different than what the factory says because they round everything off and I'm going to check it out myself. And first thing I want is the corner to corner diagonal on this. Now they say it is 30, what do they say, it's 32 in the advertisement. And I've got about 31 and a corner because I know I'm compensating for, you see these plastic piece around here, but there's also on the panel itself about a quarter inch or six mils of bezel going around the panel itself too. So we'll see that once we fire it up and take a look at it. So that's, yeah, 31 and a quarter, that's, I guess that's close enough to 32 inches and if we go straight up and down here the panel is 16 and 5 8 but if we go over here to the sensor this is I believe this is the light sensor they're talking about that will based on the ambient light will change the brightness of the monitor automatically for you which I don't really care for it's 17 8 inches with that and the reason I don't care for this I think it's a good feature but yeah, if, you're, if we're mounting this to a sim, now if you're sitting on the desktop, none of this applies, obviously. But this whole review is going to be based from a perspective of us using it in sim racing, or even sim flight, for that matter. So, yeah, this is something that if I'd rather see it flat all the way across, because if we're trying to drop our monitor right in behind our steering wheels, and yeah, it's, it's just having that little piece hanging down there like that, it just kind of gets in the way. I guarantee it will. But, again... For regular desktop use, yeah, it's not an issue, I imagine. And it can go up and down about four inches or so, like that. So, yeah, if you're using it as a desktop unit, then, yeah, that's a good feature to have to be able to lower it. We have a tilt feature here that'll go out to, like, 15 degrees, like most monitors. You know, there's nothing really unique about this as far as that's concerned. And it's got a pretty good mount. Well, i got to turn it sideways. When I first saw the spindly legs on this thing, I took it out. And I, I thought maybe this wasn't going to be the most solid mount and worried about it tipping because this is a big monitor. But yeah, you can see if I put it all the way up here, it's not going anywhere. If I bump it back like that, <laughs> I'm going to break the leg. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not going anywhere. See? So that's pretty stable. I have to say that's, that's a pretty good stand. And we'll go ahead and, and walk around the back here, or look around the back and see that there is a panel, a little panel, plastic panel here that pops in and out, and that's for taking this stand off if we want to mount it to our rigs. And yeah, the problem that with that is if we take this off, in fact, let's take it off, and we'll see that there, guess what? There's no VESA mount on this thing. So that's a big for a sim racing perspective or sim use, you can see we've got two screws here. And if I turn it further, I've got two screws on the other side, as you would imagine. But yeah, that's it. That's the biggest the hole is. There is no VESA mount for this. There do, and it doesn't come with a VESA mount, which it, you know, 600 bucks. You know, I, I would think that they would put a VESA mount in there because even if you're just a desktop computer user and going to use this for gaming, then, you know, you might want to put it on one of those articulating arms that you can move around and, yeah, you, you, don't, you don't get it with the kit, or with, with this monitor, but they do have one, of course. <laughs> and it's actually a pretty heavy duty unit. Very thick steel, it's actually pretty substantial when you pick it up. And this is it, it's got the 
100 millimeter spacing for VESA. And on the back part, it has the section that's actually going to mount into that hole. So we have a VESA mount then. And this is $35 plus shipping extra. So if you're thinking about this monitor, then yeah, you might wanna count this into the cost or the expense if you wanna mount it on an arm or if you're gonna use it like we're gonna use it on a sim rig, right? So, and we'll actually see how this goes on later on as far as putting it on, and you know we will. And anything else under here? Let's go ahead and take a quick look at the input outputs. Now it's got a lot of, this, of these monitors are now coming with these C ports. Let's go ahead and flip this. First, we'll take a look at this. They call this an 1800R curvature or the radius. So there it is. And you can see it's, it's got a pretty good curve there. Right, and on the bottom, while we have it, let's show you some of these inputs. Let's get some light on it so you can see it. That looks pretty good. So we'll go over here, start over here. That's the power supply. Then we have the 3.5 millimeter audio out. We've got a couple of HDMI ports. We've got a full size display port output or input rather. And then we've got a couple of USB 3.1s right here. And next to that will be the USB-C, which is also a 3.1 or 3.2 or something like that. Cool thing about that C is we can actually run DisplayPort signals, if your card supports it, obviously, over to the monitor via that USB-C cable, which is just another interface, really, at the end of the day, because most of us are using DisplayPort. And speaking of DisplayPort, this comes with some cables. And we'll show you the cable it comes with. I'm not sure why they're doing this, but it's got the regular display port, the full size, if you will, on one end, but it's got the mini on the other end, the little, the little one. And this monitor does not have a mini port. So that means your graphics card is gonna have to have a mini port for you to be able to use this. Now some do, but a, a lot of them don't these days. I have one that had three mini ports on it at one time from NVIDIA. And yeah, now it seems they're all coming with this size. But you can get a converter for this or just get you another cable and toss this one or sell it on eBay or something, I don't know. But I'm a little perplexed that, you know, why would you put this in here if that doesn't have a mini port on it? It's got a full size. Anyway, that means your graphics card's gotta comply. Right, so what else we get? We get the C cable and there it is. See the little, that's where the future of USB is obviously. These C connectors are on everything now that's coming out. And we have a power supply and it's kind of opened and out and the wires are hanging out because I'm going to actually fire this up in a minute. And we have the plug obviously that comes with it. This is 120 watt or I think it's 20, yeah, 20 volts by six amp at six amps. So that's 120 watts if my math's right. So yeah, the usual brick here, nothing special. We just lost a little piece that came off the back. It'll be all right though. And it also comes with this. This is a little plastic piece that clips onto the back. So it can dress up our cable management. So this just kind of goes around the back here and pops in. The usual stuff you get with monitors. I don't want to linger too much on this kind of stuff. There is a kind of a pattern here, though, that you might want to see what that pattern looks like. It's not carbon. It's like little teeny diamonds, pebbles, if you will, just a pebbly grip, which will improve your grip if you're reaching from underneath to, to the other side or from the, from the other side, grabbing the back, trying to tilt it, I guess. Right. Anything else we're going to talk about? Came with an HDMI cable, but that cable is already over here. And yeah, let's go ahead and spin this around and take a look at, I mean, there's not much else to see here as far as the monitor goes. Let's go ahead and hook it up and see if we can get a signal in here. I'm using HDMI on my laptop over here and it actually puts out 2560 by 1440, which is good because that's what we need to show you this and see what we got. So let's go ahead and just stick this over here, try to keep the cables from interfering with this big Beautiful picture we're going to get, hopefully. I plug this thing in. All right, so I'm going to find my power plug. There we go. Let's see how it goes. See our BenQ logo. And there it is. All right. And we got some stuff on here. <laughs> go ahead and take care of that real quick. There we go. And you can see we've got our picture of our the beautiful new BMW M8 GT car. Gorgeous, just a piece of gorgeousness, if that's a word. <laughs> anyway, so you can see, yeah, it's a pretty bright monitor. I've had actually have it on standard mode now. It's not on HDR. HDR tends to make it darker because of the contrast improvements that they're trying to get with HDR trickery. So anyway, 
Yeah, I'm standing right next to it here, and I can see some pixelation here on this text. And I'm not surprised by that because I'm closer, number one, than you guys are going to be. You're not going to be able to see that. But also, this is a 32-inch monitor, much more real estate. Well, not much, but it's pretty substantial difference in real estate versus my 27-inch monitors over here that I have these IPS panels. They're also 2560 by 1440, but they're going to be crispier or sharper looking pictures on that and text because the pixels are closer together because we're cramming them into a 27 versus this 32. That makes sense. But if I stand back from this about 24 inches or so, really the pixelation is kind of a non-issue. And and again, that's why they, they do it this way, because they know that you're not going to be stuck to the monitor real close to it, rather. So, yeah, this is a bezel I was talking about the, in the actual frame here, or actually in the... Is that a, I guess that can't be a dead pixel if it's in the bezel. And this thing is, again, about a quarter inch on the top part. I think it's a quarter inch all the way, about six mil. Yeah, let's see, about six mil. And on the side, it's the same. No, it's actually five mil on the, on the sides going down. So it's a little bit thinner on the sides, which is good if you're going to mount multiple monitors and butt them together so we have or overlap them a little bit. Problem with the curved monitors, though, with that, if you're going to have multiple monitors in a triple setup, is most of the games so far at this point, as far as I understand, don't support the curvature of these monitors. So if you did a triple with curvature, there might be some distortion introduced because all the games are assuming that our panels are flat when we're running triples. Something to be aware of when, if you're thinking about going with the curves. Now, eventually, they might figure that out or fix that or make it better or whatever. So, yeah. This also is a VA panel, what they're calling a VA panel. And there's IPS models, uh, panels rather that I have. They also have TN panels. This is the VA. And this is supposed to be you know, the best of both worlds between a TN and an IPS. The TN's fast refresh rates, uh, but it's really not. Uh, and the IPS, as far as, uh, not refresh rates, but actually the update rates, or the, the latency or delay, if you will. And this is uh, actually four milliseconds on this panel. But so are my ASUS uh, Republica Gamer IPS panels over there. They're actually four milliseconds, too. And, of course, t most TM panels are one millisecond these days. And to be honest, though, when I see a, a one millisecond versus a four millisecond and playing a game, I, I don't know, maybe something's wrong with my eyes because I certainly can't tell the difference between the two as far as the update rates, right, or the delay. But yeah, it's a big picture, and we'll see how it looks. Really, I can't really compare it to anything because it's just sitting here and we're not driving it, so uh, obviously we're going to do that in this review. And I just wanted to show you guys what the actual picture looked like. Also, I wanted to show you this menu. Now, they've got a cool menu system here. It, like, they're always getting better, it seems like, menu systems. And I kind of have, I have these joysticks on these rogues, the Republic of Gamers, which I don't mind using. It's pretty quick and intuitive to me. But some of these monitors, especially my old Asus monitors, just had these uh, text, or symbols, rather, over the buttons that are underneath here. And you, if it's dark, you can't really see those symbols. Even if it's light, you got to, you know, my eyes are getting old. I, I can't see the symbols that well to know how to navigate the menus. But these menus here, you can hit any one of these buttons that are under here. And what will happen is it will pull up this little menu bar down here. All right? And all you got to do is hit whatever you want for selecting something quick. And this is the picture mode. And these are the different picture modes. We'll just scroll through them. And you'll see it will get darker once we start getting into HDR. And that's the HDR, cinema HDR down here. Of course, I don't know if you guys could tell from that. Go back, try it again. My right button, there we go. So standard, and I'm gonna go down. There we go. See it change it, and cinema's changed too. Of course, all this is gonna change a little bit. Got brighter again on the sRGB because that's closer to the standard. So yeah, HDR actually darkens the screen. So that's something to consider too when you're running the HDR features on this. Easy to get to the main menu here, and of course, easy to navigate because we've got up and down. Each one of these icons here is right over a button, so you know exactly right away what you need to do to go anywhere, right? And yeah, very, very simple to use. The arrow tells me to go that way, it goes back, or we can just shut it down. So yeah, I really like the menu on this. It's very intuitive, easy to use, almost as easy to use as the joystick is. But I still kind of prefer the joystick, but that's probably because I use it all the time, and yeah, we're comfortable with what we use the most but easy to get used to that one, I'm sure. 
So yeah, that's about it. I think there's really uh, 400 HDR. That's what this panel has too. I meant to mention that. And we know iRacing has just come out with their HDR implementation. So we're going to be trying that and see if it works. But right now, HDR is pretty, it's, it's kind of a mess as most technologies are when they first come out. Kind of hit and miss. Uh, you know, you can turn it on the game, you can turn it on the monitor, but if the card doesn't support it, if you don't do some trickery in the card trying to make the HDR work, there's a lot of, a lot of things you have to research to get HDR to really work on this, I think. And yeah, we'll see, we'll just see what that is anyway. It, this will emulate HDR though. And if you put iRC in HDR and put this in HDR, if the car doesn't support it, it'll put it in emulation mode for HDR, which is, we'll just have to see if you guys can tell what the differences are, because I plan on running two, two of the same screen here in two separate shots, put them together and see what they look like. Right, so that's about it for the closer look. What we'll do now is go ahead and do a segment on putting this $35 VESA mount on here. <laughs> I want to call this the VESA mount tax. How about that? All right, because they don't put it in with this $600 monitor. And we'll go ahead and get to mounting that, and obviously then we'll put it on the rig and do some driving and start our real comparisons. So I was able to get the monitor laid down on a old towel that I keep around the SRG just for these kinds of instances. And I want to show you guys real quick. I'm going to go ahead and just kind of tilt this up. Not slipping anywhere, hopefully. And you can see that right in here, We've got two screws, and on the bottom, we had the same setup right there, okay? So obviously, we're going to have to take those out. But I also want to show you that this thing is actually, see how this moves? And that gives us the tilt on the monitor face or the actual panel. There's a spring in here. I'm going to be able to show you this. We'll try to see it. There it is. All right. See that spring in there? That is keeping tension on this. So we have to be mindful of that when we're taking it off that we might have to kind of push it out like that to get the spring to release. But we really won't know until we get there. So yeah, let's go ahead and turn this puppy back around. Gently lay it down. Is that gentle enough? <laughs> All right, now it's Phillips screws, so I'm gonna be using a Phillips bit, and I got a super long one because I don't want this part of the drill banging up against this if at all possible, so we can put it back together and no one will never know that it's been off. There we go. And this is, I'll show you the screw right here before we get the rest of them out. This is a metal, you can see the fine thread on that, so it's going into metal, which it should in a VESA mount. Yeah, you don't want it to be going in plastic to try to support one of these heavy panels. So yeah, easy enough, put it in the screw bucket and we'll go ahead and speed this up to get the other three out. Okay, so we've got the other three screws out. Put those in the little magnetic dish there so it doesn't go anywhere. And again, this, like I said before, it has some spring tension, so I might have to bend this a little bit to get out, or it might just lift straight out. Let's see how they've done this. Actually, there's some tabs in here. There we go. You have to kind of lift it back up first and then kind of slide it back towards yourself because there's some capture tabs in here. I'll show you those right here on this metal bracket. Doo -doo -doo. See those little tabs right here and right over here. So those kind of go under first before it sits flat. And there we have it. The stand is now off. Awesome. So we'll put that somewhere where it won't get hurt. At least we hope it won't. And now we're going to put this guy on. So this has three screw holes on it. And really the back of the panel here, if you can see this, let me show you what we've revealed since we've taken that off, is there is three holes in there. See them right here and right down in there. So we're gonna put use all six of these screws to put this piece on there. And of course, this is the piece right here. This section is what's gonna match up. It's pretty simple, but because it's, it's got this little notch in here. There's, there's no way to, see that little notch on both sides of that bracket? There's no way to mess this up. It just goes in like it goes in. And there are no tabs on the top. So it should just kind of fit down in there. And the thing is, the, about this is you can see that once I have this in here, I can't get to the screws anymore. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to drop the screws in there as I put this in here. It could be a little fiddly. 
In fact, I'm going to pull this towards me a bit. Just so I can get over top here and take a peek at what's going on. And yeah. So, these are the screws that came in the bag. And hopefully, we can get these to stick to the end of our tip. If my tip has enough magnetic charge in it. If it doesn't, I'll make it magnetic. So, let's see. All right. Fits pretty tight. So, I think if you take your time and go in with this. In fact, you know what I'm going to do? Yeah, let's bear with me here. I don't need this long bit anymore. I'm going to go ahead and grab a shorter one. It's going to make things a bit easier. And easy is always good, so we'll get a little short bit here. Right. So we'll put our screw on there. And you can see the screw is not dropping. So I'm excited to see if this is going to work. And hopefully my little light here on my drill bit will give me enough light to see what's going on in there as I'm going in. This is a bit tricky. Not, not too difficult, but a bit tricky. Let's see if that went in. All right, so it did go in. Ha, success. So what we'll do now, obviously, is get the rest of these screws in and we'll speed that up as I do that and hopefully all of them will go in as easily as that one did but usually when you do these things they tend to give you a bit of a struggle but we'll see as we go in Alright, so we're done. And yeah, that took a little while because you have to go in easy and slowly with this stuff. You don't want to strip anything out, obviously. That would be a disaster. But yeah, everything's pretty tight. Now, I'm not going to do the final tighten with this. I always get a Phillips screwdriver and do it by hand when we're talking about this kind of application. Just to make sure that I can feel the torque tighten up to a point. You don't want to strip it out. Yeah, like I said before, <laughs> that would be bad. Right, so now... It's actually pretty close as far as the, the way it fits on here. As you can see, it's, it doesn't stick out a lot. Let's go ahead and do it this way. So yeah, that's, that's pretty thin. I, I thought it might stick out a little bit more than that, but it's pretty deep inside that enclosure. All right, so now all we've got to do is go over to the rig, take the other monitor off, and get this one on. And when we come back, we'll have that set up. Hopefully, I'll, I'll have it all running by then, and, and then we'll take a look at it as n in its native resolution and start making some comparisons to our IPS monitors. So first, let's talk about G-Sync working on a FreeSync monitor. <laughs> as you can probably surmise by now by what we're seeing here, yeah, it's not playing too well with G-Sync. And I went and looked for the NVIDIA certified or approved or whatever list that they have that says that these monitors will work with G-Sync, but you can see here, um, yeah, it didn't say, by the way, that it would work, and I really wasn't expecting it to, but I decided to go ahead and play around with it anyway, so you can see what G-Sync is doing. I'm actually going to get out of the car now, get out of the pit, and get back into just the, the game screen, and yeah, see, it's still doing it. doesn't matter what content I'm displaying on the screen in G-Sync, as far as when it's in the game, yeah, that's what it's doing, it's just blinking. So, yeah, I can officially say I think that G-Sync is not working with this BenQ monitor. So here's an example of HDR running versus HDR not running in iRacing. And this is actually HDR is turned on on the monitor also, with the monitors only running HDR in emulation mode. I couldn't, I tried, I spent a lot of time actually, more time than I should have, trying to find an answer here to make this work off my Geo NVIDIA card to 1080 Ti and I just couldn't get it to work right. Uh, the driver wouldn't let, and it's the most recent driver I could find, it just won't let me choose the 10-bit color depth and some other things that I'm supposed to be able to choose. So yeah, it's a bit of a, a mess HDR is uh, right now, like a lot of things out there I guess. 
but yeah, just I just couldn't get it to work. But right now you're looking at the monitor in HDR mode, but it's in HDR emulation mode. And of course, HDR is turned on in the game versus not being turned on on the left side. And you can see right away there's a difference. And I like the difference. It's it's more contrasty. The darks, the shadows are darker. The whites are actually whiter. So yeah, there's definitely improvement in the dynamic range of the image that we're getting. So yeah, I really like this. And you can also see that with it turned on in iRacing, there's no, and we still, again, remember, it's not being natively streamed to the monitor. It's an emulation mode, an HDR emulation mode, rather. So, yeah, it's still no blinking, no colors uh, blinking or white blinking that a lot of people report with, with HDR turned on when their monitor is not an HDR monitor. So I don't know if that's the, the monitor doing or not. I still got to normal everything back up and try it on my IPS panels that I normally run. So, anyway, we're not native HDR, but even w without native, with it turned on in iRacing and turned on in the monitor, even though it's in emulation mode, I think it's a noted improvement in the image overall. Now here's an example of me driving with the monitor without HDR enabled on the monitor and no HDR in the game itself and this is iRacing so we've got all that turned off. Now this is the ring so it's a little bit better as far as the, the contrast and things like that of, of the Monza circuit that I was on before. It's kind of brightish on the white places you can see here as we go past the concrete but once we get back into the woods the shadows actually have a pretty good look to them on this track and it's kind of funny how when you're in different in our racing even if you're in different tracks in different places the trees can look a little different as far as the way they've shaded them uh, and yeah it, it makes it look a little bit more contrasty but this is what it would look like if you're in the ring and running it uh, in standard mode, in the monitor rather, with no HDR and iRacing, which is fine. It, it reminds me very much of my IPS panels that I run now, and yeah, the colors are good on it. I would say at least as good as the IPS models. They're about the same, I think, with the IPS maybe getting a little bit more of a nod because, again, the resolution looks crispier on those panels than it does on this one because obviously it's larger and with the same resolution that you're running on a 27 inch on a 32 inch yeah it's not going to be quite as crispy and clear the sharpness won't be there in other words so you can tell that but the colors are very good i think the colors are very close to the ips and ips monitors are known for their excellent color gamuts that's why a lot of photographers and videographers use them because of the colors they can reproduce anyway so yeah uh, no complaints here. Uh, I, again, driving with the bigger monitor, you can see the smaller ones on the, tw the 27s on the side there. So you can see how much more real estate I have when I'm actually driving here. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to use a bigger monitor, but I, I have to admit, I do miss the, the crispiness of the IPS ones again because they're smaller, but I have more of them. If I had three of these, then we might have a different conversation. But again, three of these with an 18R curvature, I just don't know how that would, in a triple setup, how that would be rendered by iRacing or other games, racing games that actually have triple monitor support. I'm just not sure about if it would be any kind of distortion where they, on the edges where they actually butt together or the bezels are, are connecting together. Anyway, I, like I said, I can't test that because I don't have two more monitors. So anyway, pretty happy with this. Like I said, I got no complaints about the color, and uh, it's, it's a very good-looking monitor, as you can see here. It's, it's really a good picture. So, yeah, it's uh, running it without any HDRE, and basically out of the boxes, most of you guys would be running this if you bought one. All right, we're going to show a little bit of night driving here at Monza. And the reason I'm showing you this is because the blacks actually look a little bit blacker to me than they do on the IPS panels. And the reason is this, I'm going to show you a picture here of, you can see the AV panel versus an IPS panel, at least these ASUS IPS panels as far as the backlighting. And you can see the IPS panels are much brighter than this AV panel from BenQ. And it does have a, a peculiar lighting of the back panels. You can see how it's kind of a spots, like a, like a spotlight's coming out from the sides a little bit, but still, much darker than the IPS monitors. Now, back to the video, that translates to, well, a blacker black, if you will. And I could tell 
I've been obviously using my IPSs all the time. I could tell right away that the, it was just a little bit darker black. I mean, it was just an inkier black, I guess, is the best way to describe it when you're driving at night. So, yeah, it, it's, I could do it either way. It really wasn't that much of an impact on my driving uh, as far as you know, the ability of being able to see anything. But it was nice to see there's a little bit more contrast because of this uh, darker night, if you will, with the colors when the headlights light everything up. There is a better contrast there and better color rendition, I think, because of the blackness of the background of the screen in itself. So, yeah, I like the AV panel for that. And I'd like to see the IPSs having not as much light bleed. I didn't realize how much they had until I put it up against this AV monitor. So anyway, just want to show you guys a quick clip of that. Final thoughts of the BenQ EX32 OR curved monitor. <laughs> this is the first curved monitor that I've had a chance to spend some time with. I've been looking at them for a while, but was never interested enough really to buy one. So let's go over what this monitor brings to the table. With a 32 inch or 31 and a quarter inch usable viewing area, it's noticeably larger than my current IPS panels. As you can see from the G-Sync compatibility video, it dominates the 27 inch panels next to it. It is a VA panel, which is supposed to be the, or bring rather, the best characteristics together of a TN panel and an IPS panel. But with a four millisecond delay, the VA panel used in this BenQ has the same delay as my IPS panels do. So not any faster for my situation. Also, the off angle viewing of the BenQ is very good. Just as good as the IPS, I think. I don't know how much the 18R curve helps with this, but the results are pretty much undeniable. Speaking of the 1800R curve, it is a tighter radius than some of the other curve monitors out there. I wish I had three of these to test for any edge distortion when running in racing games with a triple monitor configuration. I know most games out there do not compensate for triple curve monitors. Maybe in the future they will. That said, there is no distortion on this monitor at the edges. Just as clear at the edges as it is in the center. At a 2560 by 1440 resolution, images on the BenQ look very good, especially when considering the amount of real estate this panel has. Although, when put next to my IPS monitors, it did not have the clarity that those do. But really, this is no surprise, because they have the same 2560 by 1440 resolution, but with a smaller screen area, and of course, you would expect them to look a little bit more crispy. Unfortunately, G-Sync will not work with the EX3203R, but it may in the future, and I can't din, ding rather BenQ for being a FreeSync 2 panel to begin with, so it was never intended to be compatible with G-Sync. I also tested the backlight bleed between the AV panel and my IPS panels, and as you can see in the video, the BenQ AV panel has a lot less backlight bleed than the IPS panels. Quite a difference, in fact. This translated to colors being a bit more vivid that was most noticeable when driving at night. Now, the fact that this $600 monitor does not come with a VESA mount adapter plate and you have to buy it separate at a cost of $35 plus shipping, I think makes it worthy of a ding from the SRG. Another costly add-on item that I think should have been included in the purchase price. I think you could call this mount a VESA mount tax. <laughs> Similar to the Fnatic USB dongle tax, I think. Now, I wasn't sure what to expect with this EX3203R monitor when I got it, and now that I have it and had some time to test it and spend some quality time with it, especially against my IPS monitors, I think it is a monitor that will make most any sim racer happy to own. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.